I'm Denton Bramwell, Senior Master Black Belt, and with me today is Whitney, who has just completed her Advanced Green Belt Six Sigma project. Hello, Whitney. Hi, Denton. It's good to have you with us. Uh, tell us about yourself and tell us a little bit about your company, if you would. Okay. I work for a behavioral health company that has three residential treatment homes that are a bit spread out, and um, we also have a business office. I have worked uh, for this company for about seven years, and I've done a variety of uh, project works and um, have accumulated um, different experiences with the company over time, including um, developing their, you know, into the compliance role there um, and quality improvement and um, other operational areas within the company. Okay, sounds like a perfect place to apply some uh, some Six Sigma. What was the uh, what was the problem that your uh, project set out to solve? I started looking at our incident review process earlier this year, mm -hmm. and we were kind of doing that in the context context of some staff efficiency questions, and we had done some tweaks. Uh, but we wanted to do more, and particularly, I really wanted to see us get something that was um, a lot more stable as a process. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have these incident reports that uh, we're required to do for different reasons, um, primarily for state licensing, but over time they had just kind of accumulated other burdens of licensing and accreditation and other organizational goals, so they've kind of become a little bit of a behemoth in the organization. Okay, so what what might an incident report entail? What Tell me about these things. Okay, so the, the primary reason is to capture safety concerns. Mm -hmm. So when there's an event that happens that would be out of the norm that we would want to track so that we can evaluate uh, our safety performance over time. Okay, so it, it, it's completely involved in the, in the whole objective of trying to make the facility uh, a safe uh, and good place to be. Right. Okay, all right, and, and plus the state requires you to do that, so I would see that uh, as a, a pretty important thing so that your, uh, your licensure is safe uh, and uh, so that uh, your your people, your clients, uh, are safe and have a good experience and, and go home uh, in better condition than they came. Right. Okay. Yeah, so a, a huge part of this is also the data tracking is supposed to inform the inform the data tracking is supposed to inform our attention on to um, you know areas of concern for safety so over time we can improve and become more safe sure it's your it's your continuous improvement uh, uh, thing so uh, uh, every organization should have something like that okay now I noticed you lifted listed a cost reduction down here in your charter uh, I, I wonder if this isn't a little bit more like a, actually a what we call a compliance product what do you Tell us about that. Yeah, I definitely think it is much more of a, com a compliance project. And it was actually doing the project charter itself that really brought that into light. I kind of started in this initially thinking about, well, how much time can, mm -hmm. I, can I save, how much worker time, and how can I translate that into dollars? But we had already done some work on the, on the um, kind of the staffing efficiency side. So really the gain was you know, the improved compliance and kind of addressing actually the lag time in, in how long it took the incident reports to get created all the way through to being available for data analysis or getting filed in the right place so that they could be available for, um, for example, like a state audit. Okay. So uh, how did you, uh, tell me how you assessed uh, your initial condition. You looked at this and there was some data that uh, convinced you that you, that, ha that you had a problem. <laughs> Tell me about that. Yeah, I, I had some anecdotal data before I started the Six Sigma project 
that we had some issues with latency, but I, I didn't really know how bad it could be. And I also wasn't really sure that during the time frame that I was collecting this information that I would get some good examples. Um, and I think I did get some good examples of how bad the process can be because as you see, we have three really um, bad outliers in terms of our latency time from the time of the event to it actually showing up in our business office to be processed and, and filed correctly. And um, those, I mean, we have, these are two years or longer. So that's pretty long time to get a report through the system. Yeah, that's, that's a long time, all right, Whitney. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it, in every project, there comes a, a decision point that you have to make, where you have to decide: uh, are, Am I going to try to fix and patch up the old process, or do I need a new process? Now, just looking at this data and interpreting the capability study, uh, this looks to me like this would be a hard project to just fix. What decision did you come to, and, and tell us what happened there? Yeah. You know, I think if you take those three data points out, you'll still see that generally we weren't um, we weren't performing the way we wanted to in terms of getting these reports processed in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. So I think the mean there is is 21.5 days, and that's that's three weeks. That's just really too long to meet a lot of our requirements um, for for state reporting if if we have a, an incident that will require reporting. So I think. You know, that might have been a system, if we were just looking at that 25 point, or the 21.5 days, uh, we might have just said, okay, maybe we can just improve upon this. But I think that the the three outliers highlight a problem that was in the system. We were using a paper-based system, and there was no way of knowing when something had gotten clogged somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a completely impossible to track. And um, I don't know what the story is of these three incidents, but I have had stories of people finding, you know, a, a stack of incident uh, reports uh, stuffed in a cabinet somewhere, and they bring it to me, and it's like six months old. Oh, dear. So, okay. Yeah. So this, this process is not stable and predictable, and the average is much too long. And so I think you made the decision that you were going to replace the paper decision, uh, paper process, did you not? Yes. Okay. So um, I ended up replacing it with an electronic process that is embedded into our electronic health record. Cool. Okay. Can you uh, explain to me uh, how much better the new process is than the old one? Well, it's a great deal better, as you can see from this chart. Um, the mean went down to, to eight days, mm -hmm. which... It is a big improvement. So we're talking just a little over a week, and this was, you know, still trying to fine tune it a little bit too, and still learning through that process of, um, you know, throwing out, putting out the initial new system and, and evaluating it. And I think we saw a huge improvement uh, with just introducing the new system. Okay, I I really like uh, using the split process behavior chart as you've done here, <clears throat> but I noticed that you also gave me a uh, t-test. Now, the t-test is usually something we take up in black belt, so it's kind of an advanced tool. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I had recalled using t-tests from my statistics classes, and I was kind of familiar with it, but it was kind of an opportunity also to reorient myself to it which is why I wanted to play around with it. So a t-test is used to evaluate if you have, or in this case, um, is the mean from one sample the same or different from the mean from another sample. Yep, exactly. And here you can see that, at least um, on the right tail test, that these means are statistically different. The problem here is that there, there's some assumptions behind t-tests uh, one is normality, another is homogeneity, and I actually don't recall the third. Independent. Um, but this violates, oh, independent, right, this is their distinct um, samples. So this violates the homogeneity in a very big way. You can see that those outliers are really um, affecting 
that first sample. Yeah. So it violates that assumption. Just, just from my experience, Whitney, and watching people use the t-test, homogeneity is the is is the big assumption, and uh, most people get fastened on uh, on normality, which uh, they don't need to worry too much about. Now, also at the end of your project, you put in place a, a control plan to uh, make sure that things don't drift back to the bad old days. Why don't you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, so as I watched um, the process play out with the new system, I observed that you know there still needed to be some kind of uh, prompt for people to actually compete, complete the process of the incident review. Mm -hmm. um, that allows managers to get feedback to uh, staff so that they know if they performed correctly in the event of an incident. It also enables us to quickly identify safety concerns. So it's kind of the primary function there. And um, I, I didn't think that we were going to get a kind of across the board really well enforced um, deadline requirement. So what I did was I created a system of automated alerts using um, an RSS feed to notify managers when they have an incident report that they have to review. Mm -hmm. I also created an alert um, system for me that triggers me to pay attention to the types of incidents that may have a reporting requirement. That way I can interface very quickly and, you know, with a manager after an incident and let them know that there is going to be a re reporting requirement, so they are going to have to pay attention to a deadline. Good. Sound that enables us to not, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, it sound, sounds like you've really thought about uh, getting uh, people notified and escalating it if it doesn't get immediate attention. Yes, that was kind of, that was the hope there. Good. So uh, the, it's a very... The other thing I... Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, go ahead. So the other thing that I worried about was the the drift that happens when people are training. I think there's a lot of training that occurs by, well, this is how I do it, and mm -hmm. not necessarily based on process instructions. Mm -hmm. And every healthcare company that or business that's a, accredited through the Joint Commission has a requirement to have a competency assessment. And it needs to be done at hire, and it also needs to be done at least every three years. And we actually do ours annually. So what I did was on the competency assessment um, for all employees, instead of just saying trained to do incident reports, it now says trained to you know review the instructions on the incident report that are in the system that we have. So having them look at the embedded instructions that that we've generated versus having something that's kind of more evolving as um, as workers start to pass information from one to another. Yeah, uh, that's a fundamentally correct concept. The whole thing of having standard work instructions and not allowing it to function by word of mouth, as you put it. You know, one employee says, "Well, this is the way I do it," and the the system evolves without your knowledge. Uh, Whitney, this is just a, a splendid project. I really want to congratulate you. This is very well done. Thank you, Denton. Th thanks for being with us, Whitney. All right.